So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are fifty righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. He answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're in the middle of a series on the book of Genesis at the moment. We're going through the narrative about Abraham. And last week we studied this passage where uh, the Lord himself appears to Abraham and along with two angels. They have dinner with Abraham. They promise that uh, within a year his wife will become pregnant and will have a, a child. His wife laughs at the Lord and the Lord says, hey, why are you laughing at me? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And uh, she says, oh, I didn't laugh. And he says, yes, you did. And so we're picking up that passage today, and uh, one of the things that, one of the big applications for last week was that I challenged you to pray big prayers to the Lord, pray things that only the Lord can accomplish, and ask him to, to move in a, a way in your life where you have to question, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And one of those things that I challenged you, or that I told you, I shared with you, that I was praying for is that the Lord would start a new work here in Somerville, and it would be so surprising to see a movement of the Holy Spirit in Somerville where people are coming to know him, where revival is breaking out, where we get to see the Holy Spirit doing something new and unfounded here in this area. Somerville just being one of the most skeptical areas in the entire country, educated areas in the entire country. And that's something that I've been praying for for quite a while and will continue to. Uh, little did I know that as I was sharing that with you, there was actually a what they call a revival, breaking out at a college campus in, uh, Wil in Wilburn, I believe is the name of the, the city, in Kentucky, at Asbury University. Have you guys heard about this? I, I mentioned it during the newsletter this week. Um, it's pretty amazing, last Wednesday, there was, not this past Wednesday, but the one before, there was a chapel service, like 11 days ago. And as the chapel service was going on, the Lord just started doing something really amazing. And they have the sermon actually online. It was so encouraging as a preacher, as a pastor, to watch, to watch just a little bit of that sermon, to be like, this is not that amazing. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit just like really captured people after that. And after the guy got done preaching, it was a fine message, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that awesome. Um, but afterwards... It was what God can do, not what the pastor can do. Because people just kept worshiping the Lord and they haven't stopped. So for 11 days, they've just had nonstop worship there. People from all over the country had started traveling to the Asbury University to worship the Lord uh, together. One former member of our church, Jeff Houston, he lives in New York now, he flew to Kentucky. I got a text message from Jeff last night that says, this is wild, we just, been, we just got pulled into a prayer meeting 
Uh, we got asked to join the prayer team. We were on the clock from 2 to 6 a.m. to pray for Gen Z. And so he's like, be praying for us. I, we're going to stay awake. We're going to pray this forward. And it's just been an amazing thing that's been happening over there. Uh, the president of the, uh, the seminary at the university wrote an article this week saying that revival is no longer an appropriate word. What they're experiencing is an awakening. And I guess time will tell. And we'll see uh, what, what really is of this. Because there are reports of similar outbreakings of the Holy Spirit going on in other places. It seems to be something that's spreading across the country. And may it be. May it be. May it be in our day. And one of the things that's amazing is that most people, at least in our generations, uh, I think most people under uh, you know, 70 have never seen this sort of thing happen before. We've never seen the Holy Spirit just start a new revival in this kind of way. And it's amazing to see. And we just ask the question, is anything too wonderful, to, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, the Welch, Welsh uh, physician turned pastor, he once said this about revival. He says, the inevitable and constant preliminary to revival has always been a thirst for God, a thirst, a living thirst for a knowledge of the living God and a longing and a burning desire to see him acting, manifesting himself and his power rising and scattering his enemies. And that is what we long for, a thirst for God. And so as I've been preparing this week for this week's message, I have been thinking about revival and awakening all week long, but I'm also someone who preaches through the Bible, and so I was like, all right, let's see what passage we have here, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is what we're led to as we think about this. It's hard. This is one of those passages. When we started the book of Genesis, I had this week's circle because I was like, that's going to be a tough one, uh, a tough week. It's hard to explain to modern people God raining down from heaven, sulfur and fire. That's just not something that is generally uh, appetizing to the modern palate. But yet, as I've studied this passage I've gone from dreading preaching about Sodom and Gomorrah to delighting in who God is and how he's been revealed in this passage. There's just so much more here than just a God who's on a hair trigger. This is not a story of a wrathful and vengeful God on a hairline trigger. This is the story of a God who is absolutely opposed to injustice and yet eager to forgive. This is the story of a God who's absolutely opposed to injustice and yet eager to forgive. I hope that as we go through this passage, you'll see, as I have, that your mind changes about who God is and what's happening in this passage. There's three main points for today as we consider this character of who this God is, that we might be refreshed or renewed by him. The three points of this uh, passage are, uh, God is absolutely opposed to injustice. Two, God is eager to forgive. And three, God is the same yesterday, today, and what is it, church? Forever, oh, there we go. Tomorrow is good too, uh, we'll, we'll just go with it. All right, point number one, God is opposed to injustice. This is picking up directly where we left off last week. We'll start in verse 16. Look at it with me if you have your Bibles open. I hope you do. Uh, verse 16, it says this. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down up toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him, in him. Abraham and Sarah, one thing that we see, their besetting sin, the thing that they keep going back to is dishonesty. They keep going back to withholding information from the Lord. Just a couple of verses ago, Sarah laughed at the plans of God, and God said, hey, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. She's just lying to God. Even if she only laughed in her own heart or laughed to herself, she's still lying to him. And he says, yes, you did. And so 
previously we've seen Abraham do a very similar thing. He went into Egypt with his wife Sarah and he said, she is only my sister. Not to mention the fact that she is his wife as well. Abraham and Sarah, they lie often. They withhold the truth. And so here God is holding up his, his character as contrary to Abraham and Sarah, saying, shall I withhold from Abraham what I'm about to do? In verse 19, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. The way of the Lord is to do righteousness and justice. Let's continue. The, then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave. Now this phrase, that the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, this word for outcry is really interesting when you look at it in the Hebrew, when you look at it where it's used in other places in the scripture. This word for outcry is used to describe the cries of the oppressed and brutalized. It's used in Exodus chapter 22 when it's talking about the cry of the oppressed widow or orphan. It's the cry of the oppressed servant in Deuteronomy 24. The cries of the Israelites as slaves in Egypt in Exodus chapter 2. The usage of this word leads us to conclude that in Sodom, the poor and the marginalized are being taken advantage of, that they're being brutalized, that they're being oppressed. As a pastor, I get the opportunity to hear people's objections to faith with some frequency. And one of those objections that I hear fairly regularly is someone saying, I just cannot believe in a God that would allow evil and injustice to continue in this world. Who could believe in the type of God that would allow evil and injustice? But you know, it's interesting because sometimes the same people and oftentimes different people will say something else. The opposite of that statement, which is another reason why people can't believe in God. They say, I cannot believe in a God that judges and is wrathful. Well, friends, you can't have it both ways. You either believe in a God who is against injustice, who is against oppression, who is willing to punish those who commit injustices and evil, or you believe in a God that has no ability to judge evil and injustice and just accepts everyone no matter who they are. Our God is absolutely opposed to injustice. All forms of injustice. I could just list them all, but I'm going to miss some. But he's opposed to racial injustice. He's opposed to financial injustice. He's opposed to political injustice. He's opposed to injustice to the elderly, the unborn, the immigrant, and the poor. He's opposed all the injustices he's opposed and he has a heart for the oppressed. And at the end of days, those who commit justice will receive, injustice will receive what is due for them. But don't miss this. He's also patient and careful. Notice that God does not just zoom down to Sodom to smite them. He's not ready to smite at the, at, the, at, the, at the drop of a hat. No, he's patient and he's careful. Verse 21, God says, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that's come to me. And if not, I will know. God, he knows everything. But still, he wants Abraham to understand that he's going to investigate. He's going to be careful. He's not just going to do it based upon hearsay. We often assume that God is just ready to smite at any moment. But God says that he's going to investigate whether the outcry is deserving of judgment. He already knows because he knows everything, but he wants Abraham to know that his judgment is accurate and fair. God is opposed to oppression and injustice. But, and I think this is an important part of this as Christians, as people who are opposed to evil and injustice, 
At the same time, God is eager to forgive. He's opposed to injustice. And sometimes our opposition to injustice makes us hold forgiveness at arm's length. But God, he is eager to forgive. Our society, that's point number two, God is eager to forgive. Our society is very committed to seeking justice, but it's lost the ability to forgive in many ways. I love how the Atlantic columnist Elizabeth Brunig puts it. She says this, there's just something unsustainable about an environment that demands constant atonement, but actively disdains the very idea of forgiveness. This is what makes Christianity so unique to the world, is that we have a God who's opposed to injustice, who fights for those who have been oppressed, but yet is eager to forgive, eager to forgive. Verse 22, so the men turned from there and went to Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. And so what follows here is a private conversation. The, the two angels, men that were accompanying God have gone on, and the Lord is standing there with Moses, with, Moses, with Abraham to have this private conversation. And what happens here is Abraham knows that his nephew Lot lives in Sodom. And he knows that God is about to go down and Abraham knows what's going down in Sodom. He's not ignorant to what is happening in Sodom and how terrible things are in Sodom. And so he starts to plead. He starts to barter with God. And this is the passage that we just read a, a few moments ago. It's actually kind of funny when you listen to it. It says this, then, then Abraham drew near to God, this, this language of intimacy, and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You see, this is, that's always not fair. If you're an innocent person and you receive the punishment for a guilty per person, that's injustice. In fact, that might be the worst kind of injustice is for an innocent person to serve the penalty for a guilty person. And so Abraham knows that that's not fair, that's not right. And so he says, suppose there are 50 righteous people in that city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of the earth do what is just? He's, he's really pressing God here. And he's pushing him. And he's pleading with him. And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. But that's not where Abraham leaves it. He kind of grovels. He continues to go. He says, how about 45? And all of a sudden, we're in like a, a TLC um, uh, reality show here. We have some bartering going on. And he, how about 45? Okay, 45. How about 40? For 40 righteous people, I will spare the city. 30. For 30, 20. For 20, right, just 10. For 10. And then it stops. This is actually pretty shocking. Think about this. Moses, uh, Moses, oh my gosh, why am I? <laughs> Abraham has talked God down from 50 to 10. He's gone down 40. What's another nine? You know, like why not go one? You know, for one righteous person, what's another nine? He leaves it there. For one righteous person, would you not spare the city of Sodom? And I am firmly confident that the reason why Abraham does not ask that question is because he knows that there is not one righteous person in that city. His point's been proven. His point's taken. He's accepted it. There are no righteous not one, and he doesn't have the gall to ask. But I'm confident that if he did ask, how about one? That God would have said, for one, I will spare the city. Sure, there's a lot in the city. Second Peter, now I've actually wrestled with this a lot this week, because Second Peter says that Lot is a righteous man. But I think that's a righteousness that comes through faith. 
Because when you read this passage, as you see in just a minute, Lot is not blameless before the Lord. He does something really despicable here in a few minutes. And so I think that even Lot, he's not righteous. There's none righteous in this city. Many of us view God as quick to judge and slow to forgive. That's how you relate with him on a day in and day out basis. As someone who's quick to judge you, quick to condemn you, and slow to forgive. You have to earn his forgiveness. You see him that way. But that's the opposite of how the Bible describes God. The Bible describes God, brother and sisters, as slow to anger and eager to forgive. He is slow to anger and eager to forgive you. Even you. He is patient, careful. This passage actually teaches us about the nature of forgiveness in and of itself. How are guilty people declared innocent? How are they declared innocent? They must have a righteous representative who can stand for them. God is willing to spare thousands and thousands of wicked people for the sake of just a few righteous. And so how are guilty people declared innocent or guilty people let off the hook? Not because of what they've done, but because of what someone else has done. And we can claim that's not fair. It's not fair for these guilty people to be let off the hook. They deserve punishment. It's not what they deserve, but that is the gospel. Jesus is the only righteous man. And by his righteousness, you and I are forgiven. You see, it's not that we are the righteous person in the city. If we lived in Sodom, we too would deserve the punishment of the Lord. But we look upon one who is righteous, and for his sake, God spares us all. It's unjust for an innocent person to receive the penalty for what someone else did. In fact, that might be the worst injustice. But that is exactly what Jesus Christ does. The only innocent man receiving the punishment for what you and I have committed. And we get off scot-free. He's, I'm guilty, he's innocent, yet he bled for me. That is the gospel. Let's look at the rest of the story. And what I want you to see in the rest of the story as we see what God actually does in Sodom is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Many people say that they like the New Testament God, but they don't like the Old Testament God. They like the New Testament God, but they don't like the, New Te- the Old Testament God. And I think the reason why they say that is because they haven't read the Old Testament. They haven't really interacted with this Old Testament God. They've picked a few bits and pieces, but they haven't read it and studied it and gotten to know him because the character of God does not change. And not only that, but Jesus claims, it's like the sameness. Jesus, Jesus doesn't exempt himself from what the God of the Old Testament does. Jesus is proud of it. Jesus teaches on Sodom and Gomorrah Multiple times. We'll go through those passages in just a couple minutes to to show you what Jesus has to say about this passage. We think of the Old Testament God as easy to anger and overly wrathful, but the Old Testament God constantly defies our expectations. All right, so what happens from here? Verse, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 19, I'm not gonna read the whole chapter. It's kind of long. Uh, I'll just walk you through the story. The two angels, they make their way to Sodom and they find Lot sitting at the gate. And so his position at the gate would lead us to believe that he's an important man in Sodom now. If you'll remember, he chose the land of Sodom several weeks ago or several years ago in the, in the Bible passage, but it was weeks ago in us as we were learning about it. And the lesson that we learned that week is the obvious choice is not always the best choice. Because he saw Sodom and he said, that place looks great. It looks green and lush like the Garden of Eden. I shall go there. 
And then he gets there and he lives among the people. We, we think that he has taken a, a wife from the land of Sodom and he has just become a leader in Sodom. And so his position at the gate leads us to assume that he's a man of influence in Sodom, a major player. And he, when he sees the angels coming into the city, he actually kind of repeats what Abraham did for the angels last week, where Abraham runs to them and he shows them great hospitality. And so he sees these men coming and he shows them great hospitality and he invites them to stay the night at his own home. And so they refuse. They say, no, no, we'll stay in the town square. He says, no, you want to stay at my place. Trust me, you want to stay at my place. And so he insists and they go to his home and that's when things really start to go downhill. Because when they get to Lot's home, the text emphasizes that the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surround the house. Now it's rare that the Bible will use this type of specificity. Oftentimes the Bible will speak in generalities and sometimes when it says all the men, you can assume that it's just meaning like most of them, you know, it's just in general. But here he's very specific and the author is very specific to say to the last man, every man of the city surrounded Lot's home. And they called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. This is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, this is the welcoming committee to Sodom, and it is not one that you or I would like to be welcomed by. Maybe this is the customary way in which they welcome guests who came to Sodom, which would explain why there are outcries against that city. If that's the way that they treated guests as they came into their city, there would be many outcries against that city to the Lord. It is an unrighteous and a terrible way to be welcomed into a city. And Lot sneaks out to the men from his house and he tries to plead with them, talk some sense into them, but he actually he uses a really terrible tactic because he goes out to them, he sneaks out the door and he, this is what he says, behold, I have two daughters ugh, who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they've come under the shelter of my roof. This is, there's no way to respond to this other than viscerally. It's, it's evil, it's terrible. He's pitting these two virtues against one another, of one virtue of being hospita hosp hospitable, and the other virtue of being like a good protective dad. And he's choosing to be hospitable over loving his daughters and protecting them. And it's terrible. There's no excuse for it. Lot is doing a very evil thing at this moment. Um, the men of Sodom, they reject his offer. They say, nope, that's not what we came here for. We want those two visitors that came into your home. And at that moment, uh, they start to push harder at the home. And the angels actually reach out. They grab Lot. They pull him in. They close the door. And at that moment, these men, they know what they have to do. These, the, these angels, they know what they have to do. They have to destroy the city. So at that moment, it's like a, uh, they strike all the men with blindness around the home so that they can't get in fully. And so it's like one of the flash grenades or something. It goes off and then they can't see. And the text is really vivid. It says they're groping at the door trying to get in. And, but they can't see. And so it's difficult for them to find their way in. And uh, after that, the angels say, Lot, is there anyone in this city that you need to protect? Because we're going to destroy it. And so what he does is he, he's like, yeah, I have sons-in-law. So they're not married to my daughters yet, but they're going to be married. They're betrothed to be married. I'd like to get them. And so he goes, uh, later that evening, he goes and, to get them. And he says, they're going to destroy the city. You need to come with me. And they think that Lot is joking. And they refuse to go with him to escape the coming doom that is coming for them. And that is the way it is with, with sin oftentimes, is people who are so caught in their sin cannot take it seriously enough when they have a warning. They think that everything's a joke. They think everything's a joke. And so they think that, that Lot's joking, and so they won't go with them. And so the next morning comes, and actually the text is, the text is pretty clear, like doom is coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Righteous judgment is coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not a good place. There are not good people on it. They deserve the penalty that is coming to them. Yet, Lot and his family are lingering. And the angels are like, why are you still here? Get out of here. So they actually grab Lot and his two daughters and his wife, and they pull them out of the city. And uh, Lot, there's this interesting thing where Lot pleads with them as he goes out of the city. And he says, please, let me go into that city, Zoar. I want to just go there. It's a little city. Zoar means small in Hebrew. And so it's like a small uh, Sodom. And so the angels are actually like, that's fine, whatever, go to, go to Zoar. Um, and so they spare Zoar on, for the, the sake of Lot. But as they pull Lot out of the city, this is what it says, verse 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. And what we take from that, church family, is that our God is absolutely opposed to injustice. And he will always have the final say. We don't have to worry that injustice will go unpunished. Because our God is an eternal God. And if people don't get what's coming to them in this life, they will in the next. That is what the text teaches us from Sodom and Gomorrah, that every evil, every injustice will be penalized. And this is the point of the gospel. If we don't believe in the God of wrath, then the good news of Christ doesn't make sense to us. But Jesus opened himself to the wrath of God on our behalf. Our God is eager to forgive, e- eager to, pour the sin, to put the sins of evil people on his son, and to pour out his wrath on his son as opposed to upon us. Jesus died for nothing if God is not a God who penalizes evil. Now there's a temptation as we read this passage in Sodom and Gomorrah to just look at the thing and say, this is like a cartoon, okay? This, like, there's a lot of cartoonish kind of behavior. The fact that it's like every man to the last man, I can't, that's hard to believe that they're all there. There's this scene that we'll talk about in just a minute of, of Sodom's wife, or of Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. It just feels just B-list movie as you, as you read through this thing. But then... <laughs> when you look at archaeology, there's actually some interesting things that have been reported recently. So there was a, a paper two years ago in Nature, uh, which is one of the top scientific magazines. I mean, one of the top two, Nature and Science, are like the two that if you can get in one of those, your career is set from what I understand. So this paper was released in Nature. Uh, they were doing excavation of a site in this area. And there, I, I guess there's some dispute over this. Of course, there is with everything. But just listen to this. I think it's just super interesting. So they found the city in the region um, that was destroyed by what scientists call a sudden high-temperature destructive event. For example, the pottery was melted on the outside but untouched on the inside. And so it was a sudden high-temperature event. And so the researchers, as they studied it, they concluded that warfare, a fire, even a volcano, could not produce heat intense enough to cause this sort of melting. The most likely cause from this sort of melting, they determined, was a space rock. Um, I love that's a scientific term, space rock. Um, (laughs) But the only problem with a space rock is that there's no crater. There's no crater anywhere near. And so what they suppose happened, this is in in nature, okay? What they suppose happened is that a meteor traveled through the atmosphere at a very high speed and exploded two or three miles above the city in a blast 1,000 times more powerful than Hiroshima. Air temperatures rose rapidly to over 3,600 degrees. Everything began to melt. And then there was a 750 mile per hour wind that ripped through the city. None of the 8,000 people in the city survived. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like God raining down fire and sulfur upon a city. 
and archaeological evidence that something of that sort happened in that area around the same time. One curious detail, as I mentioned earlier about this, um, is Lot's wife. Now, Lot's wife probably grew up in Sodom, and he probably met her there. We don't have any record of Lot having a wife before Sodom. And he took his wife, and, and they're leaving. And what the text says about his wife is really interesting. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And the way I've always understood this is, like, maybe it's wrong to look back. I don't know what the, what the problem is there. Like, she, she looked back and immediately just turned to, into a, a pillar of salt. But as I research what Jesus has to say about Lot's wife and uh, what commentators say about it, I don't know if that's exactly how it happened. One commentator put it like this. She tarried. She waited. She, she, she lingered. She looked upon Sodom. It was her home. And she longed to be in Sodom. And as she lingered, she succumbed to the sulfurous gases. And then as her corpse lay exposed, it was encrusted in salt and debris so that she became a pillar of salt. There's no reason why we can't think about it that way, where it was a longer period of time where she became a pillar of salt in that way. Jesus interprets this passage. He, he gives us a couple of different passages. I, I just want to share one with you. Luke chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn over to Luke chapter 17. He doesn't shy away from it. You know, you think about Jesus uh, teaching about forgiveness and all of this stuff, and you realize that Jesus does not shy away from the wrath of God. He does not shy away from the tough passages in the Old Testament. And here he is, Luke chapter 17, teaching on the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to start in verse 28. Likewise, just as it is, just as it was in the day of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven, destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods and his house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will keep it. And so what Jesus is teaching here that we are to take from Sodom and Gomorrah is that the day is coming when the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will return to earth. And everyone and everything will be exposed. He will see us as we truly are. And unless we have a righteous representative, which is Christ himself, the judgment of God will fall on each and every one of us. And so what he tells us to do in preparation of that day is to to let go of our love for the things of this world. Don't love the things of Sodom, is basically what he's saying. Don't love sin. Because as we set our heart and our attention on the things of this world, we'll be tempted to linger here and to stay here. That's what happened to Lot's wife. I don't know what exactly it was about Sodom that she loved, that she looked back on. Maybe you have things in your life where you look back with some type of joy, saying, oh, the days when I was a sinner, <laughs> in that way. Or you just keep returning to your sins of old. Whether that be some type of substance abuse, some type of uh, material that you view online, whether that be some type of previous lifestyle that you once lived, whether that be a, a sense of greed and materialism, whether that be, the list goes on and on of different examples that you could use here. It could be pride, it could be a critical spirit that you just return to over and over again to make yourself feel superior to those around you. And what Jesus says is remember Lot's wife and do not seek to preserve your life here, but seek the kingdom of heaven instead. This is the application here, that we to seek the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. 
We seek justice as God seeks justice. We fight against injustice as God fights against injustice. And we are eager to forgive as God is eager to forgive. You can hold those two things together at the same time, church. You can hold them together at the same time. You can fight injustice and be eager to forgive at the same time. Each week we have an opportunity to evaluate our lives and to consider if we're lingering on our old way of life. We have an invitation to a table that says, hey, put off the old self, put on the new self. Put away the old desires of the flesh and be reminded that I feed you with good food. I am enough for you. And this is the communion meal that we celebrate each week at our church so that we can be reminded of what Christ has done for us. Um, If you are a believer, we invite you to participate in this meal. If you're not a believer, we invite you to receive Christ during this time, to receive the good news that you can be forgiven for all the injustices and evil that you're capable of in your own heart. Um, Church, let us stand as we prepare ourselves for the meal, for the table, and let us seek the Lord uh, with this response. Father, thank you for the righteous representative that we have in Christ. We ask that we'll forsake the ways of this world and that we will delight in you, that you'll give us a great hunger for more of you and that we can enjoy your presence each and every day. Father, as we receive this meal, I I pray for those who are contemplating an old way of life, contemplating ways that they need to die to self instead of, and, and to live for you. And I pray that you lead us in conviction, and you lead us to trust in you and to delight in you. I pray for anyone who hasn't received the good news of Christ, that they would receive it today. And Jesus, we pray that we would seek more of you and delight to be in your presence. God, we thank you that you were so eager to forgive. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.